Please make me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, kind and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for if you know that song, join in with me. Lord, please make me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, kind and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a Sanctuary for you. How many of you know that song? Raise your hand. How many of you know it? Come on, let's let's sing it together. Lord, please make me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, pure and holy. Kind and true with thanksgiving. I'll be a living sanctuary for you. We thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing. We thank you for the efforts that have been placed into these meetings night after night after night, beginning on Friday night. But Lord, even before Friday, thanking you for blessing Pastor Eddie and, and all of those who are working with him. Father, if not for your grace, where would we be? But we thank you. We love you and we praise you. For you are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. I, um, I just want to say to you that the young lady singing tonight was absolutely beautiful. What's your name, sweetie? Amy? Amy? It was absolutely beautiful. Can you say amen one more time, everybody? Amen. Okay, beautiful. Thank you, Amy. I, I felt your spirit, sis. I felt it. Um, on last night... We began dealing with issues, some of the issues in relationships. And tonight I want to show you something. Um, I want to show you something tonight, just for a few minutes. It's on the Heritage Missions DVD. Now, let me just say, say something real quick to you. Sometimes there are resources that God sends our way and he creates through other people. Not that we may do those things exactly, but those things sometimes kickstart a jumpstart other ideas in ministry in our local churches can y'all hear me can you hear me out there okay so there are times when God will send something your way that will assist or aid in a ministry a needed ministry in your church oftentimes local churches can't do cannot handle cannot facilitate these kind of programs like this like this camp meeting but there are many times where you run into people or you come into different, um, you, come, you become exposed to different things so that there's a ministry that can begin in your local church. Now, Pastor Eddie and I are going to address this a little bit later. But one of the things I want to say to you is, brothers and sisters, don't wait on some people to get ministry started in your church. I hope y'all are hearing me. Are y'all with me? See, I'm assuming that you love the Lord. I'm assuming that you love the God that created you and me. And as that assumption I believe and I hope and pray is true, I'm believing that you will have an interest and a desire, remember we talked about that word desire last night, to do some ministries and get some things started in your church. So if it, even if it means starting small, 
it means starting. Even if it means a whole lot of people may not know, you get it going. And tonight, one of the things we want to show you is entitled Enhancing Relationships. It's one of the ministries that uh, my department oversees, um, and it's designed for youth, I mean teenagers, young adult singles, and married couples, young adult married couples, all right? And we do this event, we've had four and five hundred people come to this event for the education, the equipping, and the, in some cases, the retooling for their lives. Somebody say amen out there. You know, one of the things I'm learning about y'all, some of y'all, see, 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 y'all have some of the same issues we got. You just kind and kind of, you want to hold it in and don't say nothing. That's all right, because I'll say amen anyhow for you, all right? But the truth of the matter is, there's some marriages that need retooling. There's some single, there's some single young adults who need some re-education. And there's some teenagers who need a whole lot of Jesus. So y'all don't want to make me go, okay, anyway. So check this out. We're going to show this for about four or five minutes, all right? So Evan, um, help me out, my brother. Thank you. Um, This is entitled Enhancing Relationships. This is on the Heritage Missions DVD, all right? So this is something that uh, he going to scroll through all of the PowerPoint and get to. Bonus movies, enhancing relationship. There we go. Make sure the sound is up. Enhancing relationships is our attempt, proactive attempt, to heal the brokenness that the enemy has caused through sin, through degradation of values, through immorality. Enhancing relationships is all about mending what was broken and strengthening what is together. Yes, we actually went the year before, the year that we were getting married, and we went this last year, and it has been wonderful for us. I wish I could have started before I even began to date, before I even considered dating, and who to choose as a partner. It's a blessing to know that we are on track, and that with the teachings and the understandings and the reading, the literature, the information they gave us, we knew we were going the right direction. We've been married for two years. We just celebrated our second anniversary last Tuesday. Uh, one of the first things when we got married that we decided to do was we uh, promised each other that we'd go on a retreat every year, just at least some time to get away, to be together. And this is the perfect theme, enhancing relationships can be more ideal for what we had in mind when we made that promise to each other. My husband and I, we're newlyweds, and we're having a baby very soon, and we're, we're trying to focus our attention on how to include another life. I decided to come because I wanted to get away and experience the nature and enjoy um, the mountains. What I most enjoyed about enhancing relationships this year was the fact that they had a really great children's program entitled Jesus is My Friend. And this allowed me the opportunity to um, sit inside the different seminars that were being presented. There's not an opportunity a, a lot for our young people and our young adults and our married couples to, to have a concentrated weekend where we can meet issues and deal with situations that we face from time to time in our private lives. No one talks about it at church. And people come to church with secret grief, and they leave with secret grief. Well, this is an opportunity we can just say, forget the grief. We're going to give you some solutions here. When you leave this mountain, you're going to come off with a better understanding of how to approach the problems that you have in life. Our seminar was entitled Adventures in Singlehood. And uh, one of the things that we focused on was the fact that God calls you first uh, as a single. Uh, He calls you first as a single. And in order to have a successful marriage, you must... Uh, first uh, be a successful single. We talked often too about the gift uh, of singleness and uh, some of the myths that surround that, that God has not uh, given a special gift. It's not a spiritual gift to be single, but it's a gift in terms of uh, the circumstance that you find yourself in, that God can also use you. And we talked about effective ways that God uses single people. 
we often try to remind the community of believers that Jesus Christ himself was a single. <laughs> and uh, we have uh, a number of good examples and role models of, of the single life, a, a life lived in devotion to God. And that singleness can be a choice just as marriage is a choice. And uh, it can also be celebrated. And so I've been asked here to do the seminars dealing with uh, families and relationships with marriage. Last night we talked about going all the way for the first time, talking to couples who've been married for many years and never had connected with each other on the deepest level. I'm here at, at what is this, Relationships Retreat. You know, we got Beth, Rhonda, Minton, Martha over here. We even got Mike over here. You know, we're just trying to do our thing, chilling, having fun, shooting little b-ball, you know what I'm saying? It's me, A-N-D-R-E. You know how I do. All right, peace. Three-point contest. Yeah. Three points. One of the key aspects of the weekend, of course, is the social on Saturday night. Uh, Friday night we do a lot of learning and all day Saturday we do a lot of learning. So you can imagine that by Saturday night people want to have a little fun and recreation. And one of the key things that we want to do is include everybody. We have the three aspects that we need to incorporate and that is the married couples as well as the teenagers and the young adults. So we try to have games and activities that will suit everyone's taste. The issues that we're dealing with, it's not just Adventists dealing with them. The world's dealing with them. The issues that it tackles deals with every race, creed, religion. And I think as we enhance relationships, we learn how to work together, we learn how to love each other, and we learn how to get along as Christians and as a people. If this is any insight of what's going to happen next year and the years after, I know I, I know my church will be here every year because our, every year, every generation, we need more help to reach our youth, our young adults, our married couples, and I just praise God for all of you. Enhancing relationships is important because life is about relationships, whether it's relationships with, with your parents, your children, siblings, a significant other. This retreat is important because there's so many people who are having difficulty with what's going on in their personal lives, not knowing how to go about choosing a mate, not knowing what principles you, know, you, you use to make that decision. I believe that the greatest reward that Jesus will give us if we remain faithful unto him is when he comes in Revelation 21, it's recorded that he will reward us with a relationship, a deep, intimate, experiential relationship with him, a relationship that will never end because he said he will be our God and we will be his people. He will live with us, we will live with him, and we will be never separated again. Okay. And in him we will find our satisfaction, our fulfillment, and our joys. Okay, that's it. As we, some of you have grown up in the church, and some of you have, um, you have a long history of being a seven-day Adventist, and in that history, you have seen many people come through the doors of your churches. You've seen people come and they weren't quite whole. They were bruised and tattered. They, they came with issues. And while the series that they came, while, while they came to the church, the series that was being preached might have been on the 2300 days or on Daniel chapter 2 or on Revelation um, uh, uh, the 14th chapter and the three angels' message, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Okay, all of that is true, and all of those things are necessary. But the one area in our church that we have had, we have to address stronger, and we have to make more present, not only at these kind of meetings, but in our local churches, 
is the issue of meeting felt needs. The issue of meeting felt needs. While I appreciate understanding the history of the Sabbath change, understanding what Constantine did back in the day in AD 321 through 25, and while I, and, and I could go through helping you understand the anti-Nicene's father's theology of Theotokos or the post-Nicene's father theology of Theotokos or the difference between homoousis and homoesis and homosasius and all of I could go through all of those Greek and, and, and those technical terms with you. While they may enhance your mind, they may improve and, 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 and broaden your Bible knowledge, those things may not necessarily may not necessarily motivate you to live a better life apart from meeting and speaking to your felt needs. The barrel has to be, the, the barrel has to be a double barrel. We as people of the faith have to preach the doctrines and we have to speak to human need. We as people of the faith have to know the end time message and we have to know the, the, the reason and the purposes for the remnant being called into existence. But I declare unto you, my brothers and sisters, young people, hear me and hear me well. You've got to plan for practical felt needs ministries in your local churches. What difference does it make to my mama, my mother, one of my sisters, one of my mothers, who's on in what we call Cal in California what we call Section 8 housing. She has three children and one on the way. And I'm talking to her about keeping the Sabbath. And yet she's saying but to me, I need something to eat. While I'm heavenly minded, I do need to be of earthly good. Can somebody say amen? amen. And, I, and our message has to be double-barreled. We, we cannot afford to be mono-focused or myopic in one area and not deal in the other areas because we live, we occupy until Jesus comes. And until Jesus comes, you have relationship issues that are out of harmony with God's will. You have relationship issues that are out of harmony with God's will that begin in the home, that have begun because of something that mama or daddy did. Oh, oh. Daddy may have been abusive and mama may have been permissive. In your homes, we have relationship issues where incest has dominated a family's line, a lineage. In some homes, we have come to understand that this child's father is actually her grandfather. Anybody know what I'm talking about out there? It's hard to conceive and it's hard to believe, but one of the things I've learned in, 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 in dealing with my wife and being married to Lindsay as a social worker, she has discovered that we need Jesus in our communities. And she's often said to me, Ronald, our churches need to be much more proactive. We've got major issues taking place in our churches while, while I'm off tripping the light fantastic and I'm off in Never Never Land. I'm never really speaking to your needs. And I can't speak to your needs if I'm not in relationship with you. I've got to be in relationship with you. I've got to listen to where you're coming from. I've got to understand where you're coming from, what's in your mind. Because if I do not, then I won't be able to minister to you. And you know one of the things that's so remarkable to me is that we who claim to be people of the Bible often read over and read through and read past some of the most significant and poignant issues that are in the Bible. Remember the lady who was found in adultery, caught in adultery? Over in Matthew, and they brought her to Jesus. And they said to Jesus, Moses said to stone her, what say ye? And you know what's so interesting is that they came to Jesus with all of their Pharisee pump and pride. They came to Jesus with all of their superiority and their attitude rolling like, you know, Lord, uh, she's caught in adultery and uh, the laws of Moses say 
that she must be stoned. Uh, you unlearned, ignorant perpetrator. What say ye? Come on, we're waiting to hear from you, Jesus. Answer us right now, for you see, I've got six degrees. I've got 12 letters behind my name. I've got a PhD, a THD, an ABC, D, F, G. <laughs> and I want to know what you unlearned carpenter are going to say. And the beautiful thing about Jesus, the beautiful thing about Jesus. So you can't get Jesus upset. You can't mess with Jesus. Here you go coming on to Jesus and and trying to act like you somebody. Trying to act like you got something. You know, if I was Jesus, I'd have just done one of these numbers. Why? There you go. A puff of smoke. There stood our friend. He was a nice guy. And Jesus would have had all of their respect if he had decided to use his power the way he could have used his power. If he wanted to use his power the way he wanted. Look, I'm telling you, he knows who to give power to. Because if I was Jesus, I'd have been like, you know what? You. You. Puff. But the Bible says that Jesus was so composed and he was so at ease with who he was until he could not be forced into giving them an answer that they wanted to hear. So he decided that he would give them an answer and every one of us an answer. Boy, that's what I like about Jesus. Jesus can look at the present situation and be so deep he'll answer every situation. Oh, y'all didn't hear that. In that response that Jesus gave to them, he's speaking to us 2,000 and some odd years later. He says to them, now watch this. He says to them, while writing in the sand, and the desire of ages makes it clear that he was writing out the sins of those who brought the woman to him. Uh, yeah, uh, uh-huh, Omaras ben Judah slept with her one hour ago. <laughs> Jethro, Iliad, <laughs> on his wife yesterday, Ramesh. Hafni, Phineas, Leonardo, DiCaprio, whatever. <laughs> he cheated on God by cheating other men. And Ellen White says that as they looked while he was writing, and the Bible says, as, he, as, as they looked while he was writing, They began to walk away. And they began to walk away because in action and in spirit, they had broken the law of Moses and the law of God. They had broken the law of Moses, which says she should be stoned, but they were the ones who were part of the perpetration. They were the cohorts. They were the ones she couldn't cheat by herself. And one Bible writer, one Bible scholar says that not only did they catch her not only, did say, not only did they bring her to Jesus, they caught her in the act as the actions were taking place and brought her to Jesus. And you know, one of the things the Bible reveals to us, now read your Bibles carefully, read them carefully. One of the things the Bible reveals to us, and it suggests that while she was miserable, Anybody here ever been miserable? Come on, I've been miserable. I have been miserable. While she was miserable as a sinner, they were miserable as saints. While she was a miserable sinner who was exposed, they were miserable as saints. 
And so their misery was exposed. And their misery was exposed because their misery was exposed through condemning and through accusation and through con, con, uh, putting her down. See, when you are happy in Christ, you may not be happy about the sins of others, but you don't have the gumption and the umption in you to be to be so to, 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 to forget where God brought you from. When you remember where God brought you from and how God has led you, when others are hurting and then others are in pain and others are in sin, and it may be open sin and it may not be open sin, it may be secret sin, your heart is wounded. But if you want to know if you're spiritually healthy, the question becomes, how do you respond to sin? Is it something you're used to? Ah, oh, that's, yeah, that's, you know, that's just the way we do. Somebody lights up a joint. Somebody sticks a needle in their arm. Somebody, somebody sleeps with somebody they're not supposed to sleep with. How do you respond to that? Is your heart broken? Is your mind, are you bothered by the fact that this person is not in God's will? And I don't mean bothered because you feel better, but do you ache for them? Do you hurt for them? Do you want them to know the joy that God's given you because you're obedient? Do, do, does your mind, do you, do you cry for them? Do you weep for them? Do you enter, do you intervene and do you, do you, do you intercede for them? What, what do you do when you find out that people got sin problems in their lives? Oh, Jesus, Jesus came so that in our relationships, in our homes, he came so that we would learn, first of all, how to honor the creator. Write that down. Write it down. The first thing he did, he came to show us how, write it down. He came to show us how to honor the creator. We are to honor the creator by giving him the first fruits, our best, by giving him everything that we have. Honor the creator with your time in the morning. Honor your creator with not only your time, but honor your creator with your best efforts. Honor your creator with your time and with your best efforts. When you get up here to sing, or you get up in Sabbath school, one of the worst things that ever happens, and one of the things that I, 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 I just struggle with, is when folks slap something together and act as if God's supposed to be pleased with it, and that I'm supposed to be pleased. Just like slapping two pieces of bread together. Don't throw a sandwich, not throw, throw a sandwich together. But Jesus came to show us how we ought to honor our creator. First of all, by giving him our time. Not any time, but giving him the first fruits, giving him our early morning hours. This morning, uh, Brother Kevin and I, I, I went for a run this morning, and I have, you know, you know, we have one of these little things called an iPod, these MP3 players. And I had, and I was, and I was running, and I was listening to my boys, my group, this group called Commissioned. And they sang this song, it's so good to know the Savior that he's walking hand in hand with you. You know, Fred Hammond and all of those guys. And so I'm out there and I'm running and I'm like, when I feel them by my side, there's no other place I'd rather be. Well, I've asked God to help me to make him first, to make him best. So Jesus came to show us, and not that I'm always perfect. No, no, I'm not trying to sit here and say to you, stand here and say to you that I'm absolute. What I am saying to you is that, that God asks us to follow the example of Christ. And the Bible often says that Jesus was caught up in the mountains. He was caught praying before he dealt with the multitude. So Jesus came to show us, first of all, honor your creator with your time. And then honor him, honor God, honor your creator with your best efforts. Now, let me say something about best efforts. My brothers, my men, I want all the men to stand up real quick. All the, all the males, stand up real quick. I want every man in here to stand up, every male, every male. God put men on this planet to be protectors, providers, and priests. Come on now. Sisters, y'all ought to be 
Can I get an amen from the sisters? God put us, men, on this planet to be what? Providers? Everybody say providers. Providers. Hold on. Let me hear the brothers. Brothers, providers. Providers. Let me hear you say protectors. Protectors. And priests. Priests. Now, Now, understand. Now, understand. Relationships, brothers, little girls, little boys, they learn from us how to be the men we ought to be, how to be the providers, not, not provider of provider, not just financially, but yes, financially, not just financially, but yes, financially. Protectors, we ought to, God put us here to be those who protect the integrity of our homes, to protect the integrity of our wife's honor, of our daughter's honor, and of our little boys and their honor as they grow. And finally, God put us on this planet, brothers, to be the priests of our homes. There's no greater role. And I don't, I, I, I don't care what anybody tells you. I don't care what the world tells you. That's why fathers, that's why husbands, that's why my brothers, that's why my grandfathers, my uncles, my distant cousins, my cousin on my mama's side related to my daddy and his daddy's mama. God put, now listen to me, listen to me carefully. God put you here to be a priest, a spiritual leader. He did not put us on this planet to be sexual predators. Spiritual priests, not sexual predators. Our role, our call, our duty, our honor is to lift up the name of Jesus as men. So that when our wives look at us and our daughters look at us and our brothers look at us, they're proud of us. And they got confidence in us. But the thing we got to do, my brothers, we got to recognize our creator first. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. You were, a price was paid for every man in this tent, every young man in this tent. A price was paid. Isaiah tells us that without the shedding of blood, there was no remission for sin. And Christ shed his blood for the men, yes, the women, but I'm talking to you now, my brothers. He shed his blood for us. And in that story about the lady caught in adultery, at the end of that experience, Jesus said to her, she said, Lord, where, where, where are they? Jesus said, they're not here. She wanted to know, Lord, are you going to condemn me? He said, no. He said, go and sin no more. I'm not going to condemn you, but I'm not going to condone it either. Not only did he not condemn her, he also made sure that he sent a message to 2004 that he would not condone the behavior. He would not, do y'all hear me? He would not condone illicit behavior. He would not condone sexual immorality. And yet at the same time, he recognized my brothers. We have to recognize my brothers that while he protected her honor, he provided salvation. While he protected her honor and provided salvation, watch this. In that small cubicle of time, in that instance, he was her priest. Can't get away from it, brothers. God has called us to be the priests, providers, and protectors of our homes. It's time. It's time. It's time that the men of God and our families stand up and be men. He didn't call us to be sexual predators. Some of you, I know you're fine. Some of you, I know you got chiseled chest. Some of, I, some of you, I know you got six packs and eight packs rolling down your midsection. While others of us got little barrels that we're working on. It's all right. It's all good. But God has called us to be priests protectors, providers. It's time, brothers, that we surrender sexual predatory behavior to the Lord. 
I'm not saying everybody in here is like, I don't know. I don't know your history. I don't. But I do know the nature of what's happening in our world today. And I do know that the nature of what's happening in our world is taking place and being mirrored in our churches. More quietly in some instances and more verbose in some other instances, but it's taking place. And if it's not taking place physically, it's taking place intellectually. And yet we've got to surrender that thing. So on last night we dealt with the sisters and I told y'all about the sister leaning in front of me and all of that stuff. But tonight I wanted to address our brothers. And I wanted to appeal to you men to let's be men that God are pro that's proud of. Why? Because in our communities and in our churches and in our, and in our homes, our young boys and our young girls are watching us to see how do you treat my mama? Yeah. How do you treat your own mama? And it's time for us to stand up as the priests of our home. Brothers, we should not be the first ones to say, I don't know. We should not be the first ones to say, I don't know, when we're asked a question about something spiritual. We should be able to say, if I don't know right now, I'm going to get, I'm going to get the answer. I'm going to work on this thing. But it's time that we take pride, just like we take pride in our national heroes when it comes to sporting events. We need to take pride in our universal hero, Jesus Christ. He was all man. He was not some little girly man. He was all man. And if you know anything about being a carpenter in the time of Christ, you had to know that those were real men. They were physical. They were strong. And yet the Bible says to us and it shows us that Jesus was as gentle and he was a priest and he was a protector and a provider. I'm sharing with you from my heart here in Auckland. I'm sharing with you from my heart. I'm asking the men to stand because I'm standing. Enhancing relationships, this thing that you just saw, why that is important is because I am watching men fall away from the church. I'm watching men lead their families to hell. And during this week of prayer, I told you by the end of this week of prayer, by the end of this camp meeting, I'm claiming by the grace of God that victories will be won people will be delivered from bondage and that they will be reignited and a fire will be relit. And I believe in brothers with all my heart that a lot of this, if not all, has to begin with you and me as the protectors, the providers, and the priests of our homes. Now, why is this relevant for youth ministry? Because the young men and the young ladies are watching us when we don't think they're watching us. They're checking us out. They know us. They are watching to see how we lead. And youth ministry cannot be separated from all ministry and total ministry. So my brothers, I just need you to hear the preacher. If you're single, praise God. He's called you to celibacy. He's empowered you for celibacy. If you're married, he's called you to monogamy. He's empowered you to monogamy. If you are engaged, he's given you staying power so you can stay until you get married. <laughs> and where we may slip and fall, Rich, come play for me. Where we may slip and fall, it's all right because there's a forgiver of sin. He'll forgive. You may have to deal with consequences. But he'll forgive. You may have to deal with some of, the, some of the, the mental images, but he'll restore you. You may have to deal with some of the, the outlook, uh, outlay. But I want you to know he, he, he's there for you. Brothers, I want to see you here in New Zealand, in Auckland. I want to see you. Every last one of you, I want to see you lead the revolution, lead the revival, lead in New Zealand. Help your pastors, help your elders, help your youth directors, help them. But I want to see you on the forefront, men. I don't want to see you coming up trailing behind. I want to see the men out front leading in the work of God because we need you
We need you. I'm going to ask. I told you we're going to do some things differently. And I ain't ashamed of the gospel. As a man, you recognize that you need to give more to God than you have been giving him. As a man, as the priest of your home, as the leader of your home, even if you're single or you're a young man, it don't matter to me. It don't matter to God. But you want to recommit to being God's man. You want to recommit to being a man that that gives his heart to God. And you're going to say, well, Pastor, look, man, it ain't easy, bro. Look, this thing is hard, man. Look. Man, I can't help it. I'm so fine. They just keep coming after me. It's all right. Hear me. It wasn't meant to be easy. But it was meant, the victory was meant to be had. The victory was meant to be secured. The victory was meant to be embraced. You feel the call of God on your life, man. From the back of the tent to the front. And you want to see God do something special in you, my brothers. Nobody need know what your issue is. But you know that you need to give that thing to God. I want you to join me down front. You know that you need to be more dedicated to God than you have been. Come on, join me down front, brothers. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Be proud of the gospel. God sees you. Come on, join us. Is there another? Come on, brothers. God sees you. Come on, join me up front. Come on, press in. Let's come on. Let's come in. Kind and true. Now listen. Listen to me very carefully. Whatever imprisonment you may be in, God has the key to unlock that door. Whatever situation you may feel you can't overcome, It's not too big for God. But you got to want it. You got to mean it. You got to be serious about this thing. You cannot play with God. You cannot fool around with yourself and lie to yourself. Come clean with God, my brothers. Come clean with God. Why? He's come clean with you. The The best that he had. He didn't give us the least. He gave us the best that he had. He gave us the very best. Hebrews tells us, in Hebrews, he's, look, he tried angels. He tried prophets. But then he sent his son. He gave us the best that he, brothers, we got to give him our best. Nothing more beautiful than hearing brothers sing. Brothers, the ladies need to, fall in love with Jesus even if you don't know it just hum it but ladies let the Lord know and let the devil know that he's a liar and he getting out of my house he getting out of my car he getting out of my mind I'm getting you out because you're a liar and the love of God is what I want the love of God is what I need so devil I may not have all the answers in from the beginning, but I know right now I'm making a start with God as the man of my house. It's time, y'all. Too many of our homes are going to hell. And all they need is a man to stand up and say, I want to love the Lord more. Come on, brothers. Let's sing it. Falling in love with Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus. Was
was the best thing I ever did. Come on, brothers in the back, I want to hear you just a little bit louder. Falling in love. Falling in love with Jesus. Come on, grab a hand. Grab another brother's hand. Falling in love. Any of my pastors, come on, come on. With Jesus was the best thing I had ever done. One more time, one more time. Ladies, join us from your seats. Falling in love with Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, right now. There are men, Father, who are struggling. And fathers and brothers who've lost their way. And Lord, you told us that hear my voice, harden not your heart. But Lord, help our men to know that, Lord, we are the examples for our young men. We are the examples for our young ladies. Father, it matters race, nationality, because we're all one under And your blood is what powers everybody across this globe. And in this thing, tonight, tonight, God, there's a it's got to be had. There's a chain that must be broken. There's a door that's got to be open. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we want to fall in love with you all over again. Jesus. So, Lord, help us to be real with you. Father, you found that woman that was found in adultery. Lord, you, you were so gentle and yet you provided a way for her to get out of the situation. And at the same time, Father, you acted as a priest. My Lord, help us to overcome our sexual predatory ways. Lord, as the men of your church, as the young men of your church, Help us to have a fire and a desire and a will and a, and, a, and a want to do your will. God, help us to get started all over again and get to the word again so that our homes are right and so that our churches are right and so that our example is right and so that our heart is right and so that our mind is right, God. So that our relationship with you is right. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Falling in love with Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus. Was the best thing I Sing it on your way back to your seats, brothers. Sing it on your way back to your seats like you got the victory. Come on, ladies, let me hear you say amen. Come on, sisters, let me hear you give the Lord a hand praise. Come on, sisters, let me see you. Let me hear you give the Lord a victory clap. Come on, everybody. With Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus. 
I know that tonight somebody feels the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place. I'm not about to make another appeal, but I want you to pray tonight. I know it's good to talk with each other and laugh with each other and, and catch up with each other. But y'all, we need to seriously consider the times we're in. And we need the Holy Spirit's presence dripping in our minds and in our hearts. Falling in love with Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus. Thank you for the solos. Thank you for the praise and worship team. Thank you for the musicians. Thank you for your Holy Spirit visiting us tonight. On this Monday night. Dear God, move us beyond being spectators. Move us beyond spectatorship, Lord. Help us to know, Father, that this is not a ball game we're watching. This is all about salvation. It's all about participation. So, Lord, help us to know that. And bring us back again on tomorrow, bright and early, and in the right spirit, so that we can be blessed and we can offer you our best. In Jesus' name, I pray. We thank you. Amen. Be blessed, everybody. If you want to pray with me, I'm here. Love with Jesus.